Welcome to the History Guy podcast, the podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel, and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of Forgotten History is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new kind of streaming service dedicated to bringing you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episode, we have three stories about some remarkable animals that spent time in war and as mascots for military units. First is the story of Timothy the Tortoise. A tortoise brought aboard an English ship in the 1850s, and it was aboard for two wars before retiring to England. Then the history guy will tell you the story of Sergeant Reckless, a horse bought to help carry munitions across difficult terrain in the Korean War, who won the hearts of marines and would eat just about anything. Finally, we have the story of Winnie the Pooh, both the teddy bear and his inspiration. And now, here's the history guy. Celebrities pass away all the time. I mean, the sad fact is that uh, no one lives forever, and as shocking as it is sometimes, even the famous give way to age. And it happens so often that it's easy to miss when someone passes like that. And so in 2004, when the oldest living resident of Great Britain passed, it made some newspapers here and there, but it was largely missed by the wider world. And that's tragic to me because she lived such an extraordinary life and was truly extraordinary, one of a kind. She was the gentlest soul that you would ever meet, but that belied a life that had gracefully withstood enormous turmoil and change. No hapless victim, she served her country in true brutal wars and then came home to be famous, hobnobbing with royalty and movie stars and music stars. She is someone who certainly deserves to be remembered. And if I didn't mention, her name was Timothy and she was a tortoise a Mediterranean spur-thighed tortoise, to be exact, thought to be the oldest living example of her species. She was likely born in Turkey around 1844, and her story begins, as all great stories do, with being kidnapped by pirates. Timothy's early days are a bit of a mystery. She didn't really like to talk about her past, but one of the stories is that she was originally found aboard a Portuguese privateer, essentially a state-sponsored pirate, in 1854. Privateers are essentially given a license by their government to engage in piracy against an enemy. And if Timothy really did serve on a Portuguese privateer, that would have been against the French, who had frequent conflicts with the Portuguese. And if she really was a pirate in 1854, she was among the last, because in the Declaration of Paris in 1856, all the major European powers got together and abolished the practice of licensing pirates. The end of the age of piracy was one of the many changes that Timothy would endure in her life. While the rumors of service aboard a Portuguese pirate ship seem somewhat fanciful, we do know that Timothy was acquired by John Guy Courtney Everard of the Royal Navy in 1854, and that her size at the time suggested that she was about 10 years old. Everard assumed that she was a male, and so gave her the name Timothy, and she served as the mascot aboard the warship HMS Queen during the first bombardment of Sevastopol during the Crimean War in 1854. The war in the Crimea was a complex affair, fought between the Empire of Russia and an alliance of the empires of England, France, the Ottoman Empire, and the Kingdom of Sardinia, and it had to do with growing Russian influence in the Middle East. In the end, Russia lost and was forced to give up territories that it had claimed from the Ottoman Empire, and the war changed power structures in Europe, but not before it cost nearly a million lives, many of those to diseases like cholera. Timothy and HMS Queen served during the bombardment of the fortress of Sevastopol in the Crimea. It was a bloody affair. The Allied fleet was unable to do much damage to the fortifications, but took quite a lot of damage from the shore batteries. HMS Queen herself was set afire three times during the battle. A harrowing affair, even for a seasoned pirate. 
It was during the Crimean War that Timothy's owner met perhaps the most famous veteran of the Crimean War, the nurse Florence Nightingale, who developed the practice of modern nursing in the hospitals in that horrible war. Coincidentally, Florence Nightingale also had a pet tortoise. Its name was Jimmy. Timothy followed Courtney Everard in his naval career, serving next as the mascot aboard the HMS Princess Charlotte, a 104-gun ship of the line, during the Second Opium War. The Second Opium War was another complex affair fought between 1854 and 1860 that was between the British and French empires and the Chinese Qing Dynasty, and it had to do with opening trade in China. It was a war of questionable justification that supported the destructive opium trade. In the Second Opium War, the Royal Navy participated in the attacks on the Taku Forts, which was a series of fortifications on the High River. And again, the Navy took terrible casualties trying to fight the shore bombardment. But since it was on a river, they were forced to use smaller gunboats that could go up the river, so Timothy was probably spared the worst of the fighting out on the Princess Charlotte. In the end, Britain prevailed and China was forced to make concessions in what China referred to as the Unequal Treaty. Having served in two of the most significant conflicts of the era, Timothy continued to follow Courtney Everhart's naval career. And when he retired in 1880, he passed her to another naval officer. She didn't leave the Navy clear until 1892, after 38 years' service in the Royal Navy. From then on, she lived in England, eventually with Courtney Everhart's family, the Earls of Devon, who lived in an estate near Exeter called Patteram. It was there in 1926 when the 14th Earl of Devon took Timothy to the London Zoological Society to see if he could mate, and they found out for the very first time that Timothy was, in fact, a she thus revealing her to be part of a distinguished group of women, the first known example of which was Epipoli of Karstus during the Trojan War, of women who masqueraded as men so that they could serve in time of war. It was there at Powderham Estate, quietly munching her favorite meal of strawberries in the garden and hibernating each year under a wisteria tree, that Timothy withstood great changes in culture, lived through two world wars, the Blitz, which nearly destroyed the city of Exeter. From the 1960s on, Powderham had tours, and so Timothy was given a tag that said, Hello, my name is Timothy. I'm very old. Please do not pick me up. When the movie The Remains of the Day was filmed at Powderham in 1993, she met actor Christopher Reeve. And as Powderham started holding concerts, she met famous rock stars, including Roger Daltrey of The Who. When Timothy passed away in 2004, she was thought to have been the oldest living resident of the United Kingdom the longest lived example of a spur thighed tortoise, and the last surviving veteran of both the Crimean and Opium Wars. And while it might seem somewhat fanciful to see history through the eyes of a tortoise, she is perhaps the greatest living example of the permanence of nature and the transience of humanity. Author Rory Knight Bruce, in his endearing work on Timothy the Tortoise, has suggested a movement to have the word Timothesis meaning the wisdom that is derived from age added to the Oxford Dictionary of the English Language. I'm behind that 100%. When Timothy was born, Victoria was Queen of England and John Tyler was President of the United States. 34 presidents and six monarchs later, she passed away, reminding us all that no matter how long you live, life is short and you should always take the time to enjoy the strawberries. Timothy's is an incredible story, and I think we can all learn a lot from her life. But now we have another story about another incredible animal, this time Sergeant Reckless in the Korean War. In October 1952, Marine First Lieutenant Eric Peterson purchased a former racehorse, a mare called Ah Chim Hai, or Morning Flame, from a stable boy at a racetrack in Seoul, Korea, for the sum of $250. Reportedly, the stable hand needed the money to buy a prosthetic leg for his sister, who had stepped on a landmine. Peterson had gotten permission to purchase a horse to use as a pack animal to help carry the 22-pound projectiles used by the M20 recoilless rifles of the recoilless rifle platoon of the anti-tank company of the 1st Marine Division's 5th Marine Regiment. 
The chestnut mare, assumed to be between three and four years old at the time of her purchase, was renamed Recoilus after the platoon, and, as was often done with the name of the rifles, the name was eventually changed to Reckless. Reckless was of Mongolian horse stock, a sturdy breed thought to be little changed since the time of Genghis Khan. Although a small breed, they are a horse, not a pony, with relatively short but strong legs. In Mongolia, they are generally kept outside year-long, as they are resistant to weather. They are known for great stamina, despite their size, have hooves so hard that they are rarely shod, are sure-footed in rough terrain, and survive well on natural foliage, able to consume almost anything. All in all, the breed is well suited for the role of ammunition carrier. Platoon Sergeant Joseph Latham was given responsibility to train the horse, something called hoof training. The training included horse survival training. She was taught how to crawl under barbed wire, to lay down if she was caught under fire in the open, and to run for her bunker if there was an artillery attack. Reckless was described as a quick study. In camp, Reckless quickly became beloved by her fellow Marines. She was described as a dependable, beautiful animal, and she was sociable. If it was a cold night, she was known to sneak into the Marines' tents and sleep alongside them. She became renowned for her appetite and ability to eat almost anything. She liked drinking Coca-Cola as well as beer. She enjoyed scrambled eggs and candy, especially chocolate. She was given a special red and gold silk blanket, which she ate. She once interrupted a poker game by eating some $30 in poker chips. Sergeant John T. Myers would feed her apples, a favorite food. In the morning, she would come to his tent and wake him up by licking his face, expecting her apple. The Marine Corps was known for making a chocolate pudding that was so terrible that none of the Marines would eat it. Except, of course, Sergeant Reckless, although it was said to give her diarrhea. The M20 recoilless rifle is a 75mm American weapon that was used in the latter part of the Second World War and throughout the Korean War. Recoilless rifles eject gas backwards as a gun fires, thus countering the recoil without the need for a heavy recoil mechanism. That allows a relatively large gun to be infantry portable. The rifle was designed as an anti-tank weapon. Its munition had a shaped warhead capable of penetrating 100 millimeters of armor. However, in the rough terrain of Korea, tank warfare was uncommon, and the recoilless rifles were more commonly used as a heavy gun for close infantry support, engaging all kinds of targets. Reckless was a good fit for the company. Sturdy and reliable, she could carry 12 of the large rifle rounds in a single load. While she was said to jump the first time she heard a rifle fire, she quickly calmed down. After her first day in combat, she was seen calmly trying to eat a discarded M1 helmet liner. As Sergeant Myers said of her, any animals in the area would take off, but that horse would stay calm. She would memorize a path after being shown it only a few times, thus allowing her to ferry supplies and ammunition alone without a handler. In combat, she would often carry a wounded Marine back on her return trip. Her most famous battle was the March 26th to 28th, 1953 Battle for the Outpost Vegas. The battle was fought just four months before the end of the war, as Chinese troops tried to overrun UN positions in order to improve their leverage in ongoing peace talks. It was a desperate fight in one of the bloodiest battles of the Korean War. Reckless's platoon was stationed on a hill opposite Outpost Vegas, where their fire of their recoilless rifles was vital first to defend and then to retake the position. During one single day, she made 51 solo trips for ammunition, carrying 386 recoilless rifle rounds to her platoon, covering a distance of 35 miles in that day. In 2013, Sergeant Harold Wadley recalled, I looked back at the eastern skyline through all the smoke and fleeting flare light, and I could hardly believe my eyes. The silhouette of a heavily laden horse came in and out of view along the ridge. Reckless received two wounds from shrapnel in the battle, one on her flank and one above her eye. She is seen here with Navy Hospital Corpsman George Doc Mitchell, who treated her wounds. She is wearing an Australian campaign hat, which she later ate. For her service, she was given official military rank and was promoted personally by General Randolph Pate, commander of the 1st Marine Division, and eventually Commandant of the Marine Corps. She achieved the rank of Staff Sergeant. After the war, Reckless was returned to the United States with transport provided by the Pacific Transport Lines aboard the SS Pacific Transport. She arrived in the U.S. on November 10, 1954, which happened to be the birthday of the Marine Corps. She attended the birthday ball in San Francisco, where she ate both cake and the flower decorations. Reckless was housed at Camp Pendleton, California, where she produced four foals. She retired with full military honors in 1960 and, per military records, was provided free housing and food in lieu of retirement pay. She died in 1968. While Reckless was certainly beloved by the men who served with her, and quite the hero in the United States thanks to articles in the Saturday Evening Post and an appearance on the Art Linkletter show, Sergeant Reckless also is a symbol of a conflict in which 33,000 American servicemen lost their lives, but is still little remembered, sometimes called the Forgotten War.
Memorials to Sergeant Reckless at the National Museum of the United States Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia, and at Camp Pendleton, represent the sacrifice of the 1.7 million American veterans of the conflict. For her exemplary service to the Marine Corps, Staff Sergeant Reckless was awarded two Purple Hearts, a Marine Corps Good Conduct Medal, a Presidential Unit Citation with Bronze Star, the National Defense Service Medal, a Korean Service Medal, the United Nations Korea Medal, a Navy Unit Commendation, and Republic of Korea Presidential Unit Citation, all of which would be displayed on her blanket, which she sometimes ate. Now is the part of the episode where we get to talk to the history guy about the episodes we've listened to, the episodes we're going to listen to, and some behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. We've talked a lot about animals on the channel, but the story of Timothy has always stuck out. Do you recall when you first heard about Timothy? Uh, yeah, you know, honestly, uh, not exactly. Before I was the history guy, when I was working at an insurance company, I had a Pinterest page where I would put up historical stuff on that Pinterest page. And I think I stumbled upon a picture of Timothy and read the story and put that on that Pinterest page. So I, I am sad to say, very sorry to say, that I did not know the story of Timothy before Timothy's death. If I had known it earlier, I would love to have gone out just to see Timothy, uh, but uh, I only learned of it afterwards, and it's just such a compelling story, and then acquired the book and, and the whole story of Timothy. So it was it was one of those things that you just sort of stumble on and just find out it's just such a compelling and amazing story. She'd eat the strawberries, and they would give her gas, and so the tortoise would be over there and would stink, and she'd live under the wisteria trees and, and come <laughs> yeah. out of hibernation. And she, uh, it, it, What a great retirement for for uh, such a distinguished personage. I was, I was thinking she couldn't she couldn't have asked for anything better than that. She seemed to be oh, very, I, very I happy. Think that's probably Probably a very, very good life for a Mediterranean spur thighed tortoise. Yeah. I always love that story because it's it is so unique. And the idea that we have, you know, this tortoise that was there at some very serious serious conflicts, and she just lived through them. My thoughts are always when I I think about her being on the boat while it was like under fire. I'm just like that port, that tortoise had no yeah, idea. The, yeah. What the tortoise, <laughs> why does the tortoise know who's, well, and at some point someone drilled a hole in her uh, shell, apparently wow. so that they could keep the mascot, you know, tethered somehow. Uh, but no one seems to know when that happened. But hmm. I, you know, I, I, I don't know, is, is life easy for a, a ship's mascot in the Royal Navy but I mean, how, the tortoise had no idea why that ship was under just drastic fire, catching fire and, and all of that. But, uh, you know, just kept going through all of that. So yeah. it's a great story just because it shows how how much human history happens in the life of a tortoise. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's interesting to pet owners because, you know, most pets, you know, you figure when you get the pet, you're going to outlive the pet. But there are a few pets that are going to outlive you and you have to figure out who's going to take care of them. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're gone, and, and Timothy was one of those. Of course, the real point of the episode is to talk about all this history that occurred, you know, just around this this animal. Uh, and, you know, imagine going from uh, fighting in the Crimean War to to uh, them filming, you know, in your castle and meeting, you know, Christopher Reeves. But it also just does say, you know, says something about about life, that, that whole idea of Timothesis, you know, of, of wisdom that's derived with age, that, I mean, it, it lives this young, adventurous life and then goes on to be, you know, a wonderful retirement. And, I mean, it's, it's a great analogy for everything. I have to say about Timothy is that is my mother's favorite episode by far. And if she introduces someone to the channel that's the the episode that she that she introduces them with it is just a, a special story and she it's it is cool to think about that i remember i saw something online that somebody was like i want to get a tortoise and like bring it to uh, historical events uh, so you know like bring it to presidential inaugurations and stuff so that a hundred years from now someone can say this tortoise witnessed <laughs> witnessed all mm -hmm. these all these crazy things timothy lived that life that was yeah. That was what she did. And she, you know, apparently was just living her life, getting picked up by people, put on boats. But I, I think <laughs> yeah. that... <laughs> yeah, we can anthropomorphize that too much. I don't think Timothy probably realized it. And you know the story that Timothy was captured from a Portuguese privateer, probably not true. It doesn't even make sense for the time period. Probably Timothy was crawling around the beach one day and the next day was on a ship and had no idea why. Uh, but uh, uh, Timothy seemed to, you know, be a happy tortoise. By whatever measure uh, happiness comes to a tortoise, right? That's the, the we, we, we may not know that, but, and I think it's just cool. And she, she clearly changed lives in doing that. And, yeah. and, and that's, that's part of the, 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 the theme of the podcast today is, is how animals change lives. Uh, and that's a, a wonderful part of that is to see how, how many people were touched by this tortoise who lived so long and lived so peacefully and, uh, but, in, you know, encountered and, and, and lived through so much. I mean, talking about other animals that have brought happiness to people and brought joy. The tortoise is one of the oddest 
mascots that I've heard of, I, although I've heard of quite a few. Uh, there are lots of other ones. Do you have, do you have any favorites like among the because they're either the more modern ones, the more ancient ones? Well, I I can say uh, you know uh, of course I attended the University of Colorado at Boulder, and so I do have to do a shout out to Ralphie, who b by the way, Ralphie is is has something in common with Timothy in that while Ralphie you would assume is a male, Ralphie is actually always a female because. <laughs> no one would try to run around a field with a male bison. <laughs> I'm sorry, but Bevo the Longhorn would have no prayer against Ralphie the Buffalo. And and if you think your Georgia Bulldog <laughs> is going to, yeah, I can't, it's not going to win. <laughs> it's not going to win. If you're a Colorado uh, uh, alumnus, you would understand this. I would love to see Ralphie take on the, the Boomer Sumer wagon and see what's left by the end of that. So, <laughs> no offense, my Oklahoma uh, fan. So I, so I do have to, I have to mention that, but I mean, there's a lot of great ones that we mentioned in there the uh, uh there's this emperor penguin that is the mascot uh, and he represents norway to a british regiment and and but he i mean he marches around and inspects the troops and it's hard to He's... be better <laughs> than the emperor inspecting the troops these days most of the mascots don't actually you know go into combat well i mean i imagine those ships mascots you know there's their cats have gone down with the ships uh but yeah. for the most part and that's one of the stories part of the episode today is also talking about uh, winnipeg the bear and you know that's an example of the, the obvious Obviously, when they went into combat, they didn't take the bear with them and put it, you know, uh, subject to gas and artillery. But some do. Uh, I mean, there's some animals that are mascots, but that were actually working animals. Uh, and they have been at, at great risk. And we talked about Mercy Dogs earlier this year. And they had hospitals for the dog, the injuries that the dogs received while they were out, yeah. you know, giving mercy to, to injured troops. So that when you look at those mascots, there's various different kinds, iterations of how those are. But some of them do go under great risk. And and that's that's one of the facts of life. Taking, a, you know, horses are a good example. That millions of horses died in the in the First World War. We we have subjected lots of animals to the horrors of, of human warfare. Or we also did an episode on the ones that we sent off into space, too. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, when we sent Lotka into space, when the Russians sent Lotka into space, they knew that the dog wasn't coming back. And so the, these animals do make sacrifices for us, too. And to, on one extent, you would say this isn't terrorism and that that animal is probably just terrified and has no idea why this is why that, going on. But on the other hand, these are these are creatures that are are sacrificing and sometimes very much willing to sacrifice to protect humans. And that's that's extraordinary. And it's another one of the reasons that we that we want to remember them historically, because their sacrifices were meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of animals that went into danger. Another another story we're talking about on the podcast is Sergeant Reckless. She was under fire. <laughs> and that's all, all uh, the time. Yeah. One of the things that was extraordinary about that animal is that the other horses would get very skittish under fire and, and she was apparently very calm under fire. And that was important as they were, you know, as they were using her. But also it's interesting because they would they literally had people that were trained to train horses to do things like duck when artillery is coming. They that had was... to crawl under a, a barbed wire fence. But she she continued her mission. She was wounded. She was alone. She didn't have a handler with her and she still carried that equipment where it needed to go, the ammunition where it needed to go. What an extraordinary animal. Extraordinary. And, uh, it, yeah. And, and a, as brave a soldier as any other soldier that was serving in that war. Uh, saving lives and doing their job under fire uh, and deserves to be remembered for that. Absolutely. I think one of the one of the things that's kind of surprising about Sergeant Reckless is is that we were using horses in, in the 1950s. And I think that some people are surprised when we talk about World War One and World War Two actually had a huge number of huge horses. horses. Yeah, in the in um, industrial age. Yeah. But if you look at the terrain in Korea, uh, you can see why there was no machine that we had that would have been able to do what Sergeant Reckless was doing. Yeah, I actually. So it's you know it's interesting that someone said, okay, here's a hundred bucks, go buy a horse, and and that's that's what they did. And then of course worked. Reckless, such personality, a very small horse, but could carry a very large load, was an extremely yeah. smart horse, but also just had such an engaging personality that the not only was this horse in you know fighting the war with the soldiers, but also had just became endearing to them as it ate the, the only one that would eat the the chocolate pudding and ate ate, ate their poker chips and it's, ate her blanket and it's one of was the most just a character. One of the most entertaining parts about the whole story is is that she just keeps eating whatever they give her. Uh, she does. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm I'm not making that stuff up. It's funny when it's in there. I'm not making the 
the picture of her wearing the Australian slouch hat says on the bottom of the picture says she later ate the hat. So when I say <laughs> what she ate, I'm not, that's not like probably she did. And they made a very expensive blanket for her to wear before the commandant of the Marine Corps and she ate it and they had to remake, they had to make a new blanket. I mean, that, and those are, <laughs> when I, whenever in that episode I said, which she ate, that's not me joking. That is literally that, that horse. The personality of that horse was so extraordinary. And then you combine that with the courage and it's hard to, it's hard to believe that the same horse that had such personality, uh, that the courage wasn't part of that personality. To say that this tr this horse truly is a, a a hero. This horse knew that it was sacrificing and risking, and that it was doing that for others. I maybe I'm anthropomorphizing, but it's hard for me to believe that that Sergeant Reckless didn't have an idea what was going on and did that anyway. And uh, yeah. that's you know uh, Sergeant Reckless deserves to be remembered, like other sergeants who 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 engaged in that same sort of stuff and risked their lives that that horse did. Absolutely. I, I was reading a, an interesting story. I don't know if it's something we might do a story on at some point, but there was a mule. Uh, the, the Koreans used a lot of mules and uh, the communists did, the Chinese too. Uh, but there was a particular mule that they captured and on it, they found a U.S. Army brand. And it turns out that this <laughs> mule had originally been dispatched during World War II to the uh, China Burma India theater. And that somehow over all these years, they think maybe it was given to the, uh, like the Kuomintang um, after after the war and then was captured by the communists and eventually makes its way back to, and then it continued to serve with uh, with the Americans in Korea. And I just, I, I read that, that's, I came across that story. story. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I came uh, across that one. We also used uh, mules quite a lot, uh, say in Italy in the Second World War, because again, the terrain was not amenable to mechanical transport, but was was good for these animals. Even though we had largely, especially the Americans, had largely retired that kind of stuff, um, we didn't use we didn't use that many horses in World War II compared to say uh, the Soviets and the Germans used a used a ton of them, but they were also uh, the steppes of Russia. Horses yeah. were very useful. Well, and uh, we just had more mechanized uh, equipment because of because of the industrial base of the United States, and so the, the the Germans were very often towing their say their artillery by horses just because they didn't have. The, the production capacity to have enough machines to do all the art, art, artillery. But we did use we did use horses. I actually personally know of a story of a person who was what he was is he, he led a mule team all the way up Italy during the war. Wow. Uh, and we might tell that story sometime too. Uh, and uh, so it's it, it surprises people, I think that and it was also surprises people that we were still using pigeons during the Second World War. And and in some ways you know importantly we were using pigeons. They, with all the other communication technologies, they ended up being the most reliable technology sometimes. Maybe. We got and, radios and, and we were still using pigeons. I mean, it is an yeah, interesting. Yeah. The, the ra I mean, radios could actually be quite dicey in the Second World War. Uh, and, and in many ways, pigeons could be more reliable. Animals, I mean, and of course, animals are still important parts of war. I mean, we there was a lot of news in Afghanistan when American troops were riding horses. Uh, but again, then we're doing it in terrain where that was that was by far the you know the best mode of transport. But we yeah, also, sometimes of course, without a, without a good road, there's some mechanized transport that just can't can't yeah, travel can't. over that terrain yeah and uh, or quickly or nearly as quickly or easily or and uh, and uh, you know it's there's many ways where it's easier to take care of a horse than you know a motorcycle or whatever you want to try to use and uh, so uh, i mean animals i think continue uh, are clearly continue to, to be a part of war and 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 uh, for the good and the ill of that entire concept of that uh, but we use uh, uh, dogs a lot today still the military does and uh, they i think are extremely fond of those animals because what they do for the the troops uh, so it's it's not something that's gone away it's something that that occurred differently uh, but it is uh, again it is something that's worth remembering that you know these these were more than machines of war these were these were living breathing creatures uh, and they were subjected to the all the same horrors that the soldiers were subjected to uh, and in many ways that uh, uh, you know that makes them more heroic because they they didn't have that same level of choice so when you go all the way back to uh, to Timothy I have no idea how Timothy saw you know Timothy's life uh, I would imagine that Timothy was as turtles go happier eating strawberries under the wisteria bush than being on HMS Queen while it was on fire. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> probably. Uh, but I mean, who knows? Maybe maybe Timothy sat there under the wisteria tree and, and remembered Timothy's life of adventure. Uh, but uh, Timothy becomes a, a great way at least to measure human experience because of what Timothy experienced. And that's that's a good story to tell. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode and we would like to thank them for continuing to make our podcasts possible. As always, we continue to watch Magellan TV. I think we both really enjoy what we get out of Magellan TV. What have you been watching on Magellan TV lately? 
I really do enjoy nature documentaries. And so one I stumbled into that I've been kind of stuck uh, watching lately or, or, or obsessed with lately is, is a series called Blue Water Savages, which is a series of, about the biology of sharks. And it starts off with this premise that we, we're all terrified of sharks because we watch Jaws. And what do we really know about sharks? And it's really, it's fun. It's it, the, the people that are doing the research are really interesting. They have a sense of humor, but they are very respectful of the animals. And they're really trying to better understand a much more complex predator that, than we give that credit for. You know, I think in Jaws, I said, it's just an eating machine. It's much more than that. But I, I can say that I grew up in the middle of the United States. I did not grow up anywhere near an ocean. And so I, I think it's almost a little crazy to go in the ocean where the, the animals in there, that's where they live. Uh, and these guys, they will jump into the ocean with a whole bunch of sharks around with a bucket full of chum just to, you know, to figure out how the shark works. It's really, my heart beats whenever I'm watching it. That's pretty but brave. It's fascinating. I'm really learning quite a lot. It's the best thing that you will have in documentaries. And that is people who sincerely care about what they're talking about and learning as they go. If you want your own version of Shark Week, I, I think that this is one of the best documentaries I've ever seen on Wild. And Magellan does such a good job about that. They are These are documentary filmmakers who are looking for documentary films that do their job well. Kind of interestingly, I also was watching one on nature recently. It is called Super Senses, Wild Feats of Evolution. Essentially crazy stuff sensory wise that various animals do. And so the first episode is on sight and it talks about falcons can, they have muscles that actually like bend pieces of the, of the eyes so that they can see in different ways and keep focus. You know, it reminded, it reminded me, I used to watch this show called the most extreme on animal planet. And the most extreme was pretty cheesy, but it's going to go into hearing and touch and smell and taste and all of those different kinds of senses. So it's it's really worth a watch if you're interested in that kind of natural stuff. There are always more choices. Today, we're watching nature documentaries, but hey, the next one we could pick up could be about space or colonizing Mars. It could be about a war. World War II is always on there. Which I always it's enjoy crime, watching it. A lot of fun. There's also, uh, there's a lot of conversation on there. There's actually a, a, a history series, aren't documentaries, but are, are historical dramas. So there's there's an awful lot to see on Magellan TV. And you know, there's so many different places today where you can go and pay a monthly fee. But I don't think any one of them out there is going to give you a greater variety of ways to truly learn than you're going to get from Magellan TV. As always, we do have a special offer for folks who go to try.magellantv.com slash history guy. There's always a good offer up there. It's either money off of an annual membership. Sometimes you get a free month. There is always a good reason to take advantage of that offer and give Magellan a try. Try magellantv.com slash history guy. Finally, on today's episode, we have the story of Winnie the Pooh. Of course, you know him as a beloved children's book character. You might even know that he was inspired by a teddy bear that the writer's son played with. However, there's more to it than that. I'll let the history guy take it away. The nexus between fact and fiction is often quite interesting. Sometimes stories that you've always heard that you thought were derived from history turn out to be more legend than reality. And other times, works of pure fiction turn out to be surprisingly grounded in historical fact. And sometimes even the creation of a work of fiction is a story that becomes history in itself. And such is true of one of the most popular and beloved characters of the 20th century, a story literally about childhood innocence that was surprisingly grounded in one of the least innocent of human endeavors. The story of the world's most famous teddy bear is history that deserves to be remembered. Alan Alexander Milne was born in London in 1882. He attended Trinity College, Cambridge, where he attained a bachelor's degree in mathematics. But his career went a different direction. At Cambridge, he wrote for a campus magazine, and that writing drew the attention of the British humor magazine, Punch. Milne took a position writing for the magazine. Between joining the staff at Punch in 1906 and 1924, he published three novels, numerous plays and screenplays, and numerous short stories, vignettes, poems, and articles, some of which were collected and published as books. But Milne's life changed in 1924 when a series of his Poems for Children was published first in Punch magazine and then collected together and published under the title When We Were Very Young. The 36th poem in that book was entitled Teddy Bear, and it was about a short and fat stuffed toy bear named Mr. Edward Bear who worried about his tubbiness. Mr. Edward Bear was the name of a stuffed toy bear made by the Farnell Toy Company in 1921 and bought at Harrods Department Store, belonging to A.A. A. Milne's son, Christopher Robin Milne, who was born in 1920. 
Christopher Robin eventually renamed the bear, which was the inspiration for a book of short stories originally published by Milne in several periodicals, and then as a collection in 1926 called Winnie the Pooh, and a second collection published in 1928 called The House at Pooh Corner. Much of the fiction was grounded in reality. Milne had gotten the inspiration for the story while watching his son play with his toy bear and other stuffed animals on a country farm that the family owned near Ashdown Forest in southeast England, which was the model, of course, for the Hundred Acre Wood. The game called Poo Sticks, where players drop sticks on one side of a bridge and then go to the other side to see which stick will come out first, was a real game that Christopher Robin Milne played with his nanny. The bridge where they actually played, once called Posingford Bridge, was restored in 1979 and is now called Poo Bridge. Piglet, Eeyore, Kanga, and Roo, and Tigger were all actual stuffed animals owned by Christopher Robin. The stuffed Roo was lost when Christopher Robin was a child, but the other five stuffed animals were donated to the New York City Public Library and are on display there in the main branch. There was no stuffed rabbit or owl. Those came from Milne's imagination. And yet the line between fact and fiction can be complex. While it may surprise some people to know that Christopher Robin was a real person, the character is actually an amalgam of Christopher Robin's and A.A. A. Milne's childhood experiences and a hefty dose of imagination and the character would eventually become a burden to the real Christopher Robin. But there is another truth to the story, because the bear originally called Edward the Bear was renamed after a real bear who was in the London Zoo, and that bear also had a history. In August of 1914, 10 officers and 224 men of the Fort Garry Horse, a militia cavalry unit from Winnipeg, Canada, became part of the 6th Battalion of the Canadian Expeditionary Force being sent to France to fight in the Great War. The unit traveled east by train from Winnipeg in central Canada to the training camp in Belcartier, Quebec. On the train was 27-year-old Harry Colborne. Colborne had been born in England and had immigrated to Canada at the age of 18. He had attended the Ontario Veterinary College and then moved west to Winnipeg. He had enlisted with the Royal Canadian Army Veterinary Corps, where he had been assigned to the Fort Garry Horse. As the train stopped briefly in the tiny lumber town of White River, Ontario, Colborne saw a man walking around with a bear cub tied to a rope. The man was a hunter and had trapped the cub after he had killed its mother. Colborne bought the cub for $20. He took the cub with him, first to Belcartier and then all the way to England. It was a precocious and friendly bear that became beloved by the regiment and was particularly fond of honey. Colborne kept the bear in his tent at the regiment's camp on the Salisbury Plain, but when the regiment was sent to the front in France in 1916, he put the bear in the care of the London Zoo. The Canadian black bear, a female, was one of the most popular attractions at the zoo. Colborne had planned to take the bear back with him to Canada after the war. But when he returned, he saw how beloved the bear was at the zoo and decided to donate her to the London Zoo permanently. Around 1925, Christopher Robin Milne went to the zoo and saw the bear, which Kullenberg had named Winnipeg after his adopted hometown. He was so taken with the bear, affectionately called Winnie, that he decided to rename Edward the bear. There are conflicting stories regarding the surname Pooh. One says that that was the name of a swan at the London Zoo. Another says it had to do with how the teddy bear smelled when it was dirty. And so the beloved overstuffed children's character was based on an actual bear, part of a long tradition of military mascots. For as long as warfare has existed, animals have gone to war alongside humans. An estimated 8 million horses used to move everything from men and ambulances to heavy artillery, and as subject to shell fire and gas as a soldier, died in the First World War. Dogs and pigeons were also commonly used by the armies as working animals, and even occasionally more exotic animals like elephants and camels. But mascots are somewhat different. Their role was to provide comfort, distraction, sometimes a reminder of home or a symbol to represent a unit's history. If Winnie the Bear seems an oddity, she was less so than you might think. Five bears were donated to the London Zoo by Canadian regiments during the Great War, although Winnie was the friendliest of the bunch. There were numerous dogs and cats, but also goats, sheep, and monkeys. The famous Escadrille Lafayette, the French fighter plane squadron made up of American volunteers, acquired two lions. The male was named Whiskey because he liked to drink whiskey. The female was called Soda because she got along so well with whiskey. The tradition carries on today, with one of the more famous being Brigadier Sir Niles Olaf III, who lives in Edinburgh, Scotland, but is Colonel-in-Chief of the Norwegian King's Guard. 
It is perhaps fitting that a character that represents whimsy and imagination was inspired by an animal who provided soldiers a comforting reminder of home. But there's still some tragedy in this history. While Christopher Robin recalled enjoying the fame it brought him when he was young, eventually he came to resent being the subject of his father's books and felt that his father had exploited his childhood. The books so beloved by millions were the cause of a rift that estranged father and son in their later years. Christopher Robin Milne used writing to come to grips with his dual life as a real person and a beloved children's book character through three memoirs written after his father's death. A. A. Milne also came to resent Winnie the Pooh in his way, as the children's book overshadowed all his other works. Since 1966, the rights to the character Winnie the Pooh have belonged to the Walt Disney Company. According to an article in 2013, Winnie the Pooh is the third highest selling franchise in the world. Winnipeg the Bear died in the London Zoo in 1934 at the ripe old age of 20. That's actually pretty good for a Canadian black bear whose average lifespan is usually only around 10 years. A. A. Milne died in 1956 after a prolonged illness at the age of 74. Christopher Robin Milne also suffered from a prolonged illness and passed away in 1996 at the age of 75. He dedicated many of his later years to efforts to preserve the Ashdown Forest. The unique connection to Winnipeg the Bear is actually rather fitting in that both A. A. Milne and Christopher Robin Milne experienced the horrors of war, came back wounded, and much changed by the experience. A. A. Milne, a lieutenant in the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, was wounded in the bloody Battle of the Somme in 1916 and eventually authored a book denouncing war called Peace with Honor. Christopher Robin joined as a sapper with the Royal Engineers and served five years during the Second World War. He received shrapnel to the head when a bridge that he was building was targeted by artillery. In a way, the stuffed animal Winnie the Pooh and the military mascot Winnipeg the Bear represent that growth from the childhood Christopher Robin to the adult Christopher Robin Milne that he would become. And both are history that deserves to be remembered. Winnie the Pooh is not the only bear that was a mascot for a military unit. I know of at least a, a couple others. There was a Polish one whose name I can't pronounce. But <laughs> I think Winnie, Winnie the Pooh is probably the most famous one. And I guess I kind of wanted to ask, you know, why do you think you, these units adopt animals for mascots? Th I think there's lots of reasons. And I have to say, I, I didn't serve. Uh, and so I don't want to speak for people who did. I actually want to be very grateful to the people who did. Uh, but to, when you when you look at what the people who did say about this sort of thing, I mean, obviously with with Winnipeg the bear, I mean, the person that found Winnipeg was a veterinarian that was you know interested in in, in the animal and and wanted to I think save it. He saw the animal being towed around with a rope because someone had killed its its parents. I, I think they are a reminder of home for people that are facing the horrors of war. Then this reminds them of the you know the the happiness of peace, reminds them of compassion. I, I think that that's important for people that are trying to hang on to civilization in the midst of, you know, the, the, the worst horrors that can go on. I think that's a, that's a big chunk of it. So, I mean, some of them, uh, you, you have to say, I mean, they served in the war and they, and they saved lives. And I mean, when you look at some of the mascots and what they've done, you, you, you'd have to say that that was, you know, part of that was almost like the camaraderie of arms. But uh, a lot of these animals were, you know, they were never going to take the goat into, into combat with them. But the, the goat still becomes a symbol of the regiment that everybody can tie to because it, it reminds them of home. And I think occasionally, too, it's because of the characteristics of the animal uh, then become a good symbol of the unit. They, they, they're able to look at that and say, that, you know, we are, you know, we are stalwart like our, our mascot. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, there's so many, so many different stories about them. The lions that the Escadrille American had, uh, which uh, only one of the flyers apparently could get near. I mean, they were lions, you know, for, for the <laughs> most part, they couldn't get near them. They both like whiskey, which is, I, I don't think uh, any veterinarian would suggest you ever give your pet whiskey, but I guess most veterinarians wouldn't suggest that you adopt lions to keep around your airplanes. The, all the, all the stories of all those animals, I mean, they, it could be wild. It could be crazy. I think some of them, I mean, that represented, if you were flying in those World War One airplanes, <laughs> You you were willing to take risks and you fearless. So so you you grabbing this stray lion and then saying that's the mascot now that was that said something about the people that flew with the escadrille. Uh, we talk about Just Nuisance, uh, who was I mean Just Nuisance was a very brave animal. They they loved Just Nuisance because Just Nuisance saved lives, but they loved Just Nuisance because Just Nuisance was funny and uh, and gave them something you know that could distract them from the stuff that they had to do and could remind them of all the best parts of home and what they were fighting for. I think that mascots are they wrap up in all of that sort of stuff. I like to mentioning compassion because I think that that is, it's hard when you are facing horrific things. It's 
nice to have something. I mean, when they had these animals, whether they were on, you know, at the front or somewhere else, they, having something that you could, for instance, take care of, I think like the, the Mercy Dogs from World War One, they tried to make it very clear that the Mercy Dogs were working dogs and you weren't supposed to like, you know, form attachments to them, but people do. And it's, it is a form of being able to take care of something or uh, feel protective over something, I think helps kind of separate you from the horrors that you're that you're living through. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's, that's something that you can get from the animals that you're not going to get from almost anywhere else. Uh, that's in, true. And, and in it combat. reminds you of children, it reminds you of, of your wife or your mother, um, and uh, it gives you an ability to have some of that, or your pets at home or your farm, and it gives you an ability to have some of that, which you can't bring with you to the front. If you look outside of the military, if you look at, I mean, we were talking for a little while there about uh, uh, athletic mascots, true in so many places, in so many instances that animals bring us yeah. together. It's something that, you know, humanity shares is this compassion for animals. And I think that's maybe why they end up in the places that they do. And in some ways, that's an irony that we place, you know, dogs and horses and pigeons uh, at risk, uh, but it also means that, that 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 we get to see some of the best parts of humanity in amongst that. And I, I'm glad stories, that we, yeah, we have a chance to to talk about those today, a couple of them, because there's there are a lot of other ones. Um, well, I'm sure we will talk about more animals that were mascots or Absolutely. otherwise involved I, in combat. I think there's a, a lot of people don't know that Winnie the Pooh was a real animal. And I think that probably a lot of people don't know that Winnie the Pooh was started as a military mascot. And that's that's a very compelling story. And, uh, and, and how that became such a powerful children's story just tells you the power, the power of that, of that, you know, unifying, you know, love of animals, how that can bring so much together. Uh, yeah. But uh, I mean, it's a compelling story. I mean, as she was, you know, this is, she was found in the wild. She ended up in, in a zoo. She, she inspired so many people by just being this animal in a zoo, but she also inspired this entire regiment. Uh, that's just, that's just compelling history. All three of the ones that we talk about today were really just, it's compelling history to understand their life stories too. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed these stories of forgotten history, and if you did, you can find more on our YouTube channel at The History Guy, History Deserves to be Remembered. We will continue to release podcasts every other week, so stick around if you want more podcasts on forgotten history. You can also find us on our website, thehistoryguy.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Rumble, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from The History Guy himself on Cameo.